I'm Ken Steele. Welcome to another 10 with Ken. The COVID-19 pandemic transformed college and university campuses, and its ripple effects are still being felt. So I'm starting my first post-pandemic season with a series of episodes on the transformative changes occurring to campus facilities. Previous episodes looked at the post-pandemic campus and the fluid future of work for staff and faculty. But without a doubt, the impact of emergency remote instruction on students was even more pronounced. Today, we dig into new modalities of teaching and learning, online, on campus, or both, and what 600,000 students can tell us about their preferences. Let's take 10 and take a look. Staff and faculty, of course, are not the only ones impacted by uh, the shift to blended and hybrid. In particular, the blurring of the line between on-campus and online learning uh, has been the big change, of course, in higher education. I've been saying for 20 years now, everything that can be digital is going to become digital, whether we're talking about uh, movie rentals or music streaming or uh, library resources or lectures. The fact that we can make these things digital means that inevitably they will be available that way to somebody. The line between the virtual and the bricks and mortar classroom is blurring as we start introducing more and more technologies immersive telepresence that allows half a seminar class in Thunder Bay and half a seminar class in Aurelia to participate in a single classroom using immersive telepresence rooms like the ones Lakehead University has been using for some time now. We're also seeing renewed emphasis on the need to have students physically together, especially traditional age undergraduate students, together on campus in residence for extracurriculars. but some flexibility when it comes to lecture classes. Minerva, created almost a decade ago, has a unique model in which students gather in residence together, although they move around the world to different cities through the course of the year, uh, but all of their classes are delivered online using a proprietary platform that they've developed to enhance interactions and connectivity between the students. We are rethinking how this all looks. Before the pandemic, there were a dozen schools in the world experimenting with something called high flex delivery in which students could choose from day to day. Do I come in person to the classroom? Do I log in as uh, synchronously remotely to, to participate in the class? Or do I catch it asynchronously after the fact? Uh, and that, uh, that has become a topic of conversation on every campus over the last three years. The challenges of high flex delivery are, of course, that the faculty member is simultaneously teaching to three different kinds of audience. Usually they need a teaching assistant. They certainly need pedagogical help designing a program that works synchronously and asynchronously. The other challenge is that the classroom needs to have microphones through the ceiling. It needs to have cameras. It needs to have screens uh, to an adequate level in order to make a high flex classroom truly work. So those are things that uh, that that we've all experienced now as we go forward. One episode of 10 with Ken uh, that has become my most popular is one in which I interviewed uh, Jenny Heyman at Cambrian College about high flex programs, which they had been delivering for several years uh, as of 2020. We have known uh, for a decade or more that that when you look at thousands of academic studies of the learning outcomes of in-person and online course delivery, that in fact, a blended approach delivers a third of a standard deviation better outcomes than either purely face-to-face -face or purely online. So we've known there are pedagogical benefits to embedding online tools in a face-to-face -face course, embedding face-to-face -face interactions in an online course, and we know there are financial benefits too. Algonquin College wrote up in the New, New England Journal of Higher Education that by shifting 20% of full-time course delivery online, they were able to free up almost 40% uh, of physical classroom space, saving themselves millions of dollars in new construction and annual maintenance of those spaces uh, by by becoming more efficient physically on campus. And I think that, you know, that has convinced me for more than a decade that that hybrid is clearly the way forward. And and I believe we're going to see the technologies get better and better and better. 
uh, so virtual reality is currently the tantalizing thing just beyond our grip. It, it is already being experimented with in ways to allow students to take field trips all over the world, to go back in time and visit ancient Rome at various periods of its development, walk through those streets, to visit archaeological digs where war has already destroyed the site, uh, or to access from home an Ivy League biochemistry lab using tools like Labster to simulate the experience of working with chemicals and, and to do so safely so you don't blow yourself up uh, by making the wrong mix. We're seeing virtual reality being implemented as a way to simulate the work environment as well. Uh, so in New Zealand, radiography students are able to, ex to gain work experience on x-ray equipment virtually without the need for live radiation or live patients. We see uh, airline pilots training on simulators, obviously, but also mechanics, crash scene investigators. In Lethbridge, it's wind turbine technicians. Elsewhere, it's, it's oil and gas industry uh, workplaces that are simulated and give students the opportunity to gain some, some simulation of hands-on experience. And it's touching all kinds of fields you wouldn't think of. Uh, social work students are getting experience doing home safety inspection visits. Uh, paramedic students are being immersed in simulations of mass casualty scenarios at a much easier way than having to find a bunch of actors and recreate the scene on campus. Teachers college students are learning how to deal with difficult first graders in VR. And surgeons are learning how to work through haptic feedback mechanisms in VR. Uh, with with AI systems that monitor their every move and give them formative feedback as they go to improve their technique. Uh, I think eventually VR is going to allow us to deliver a lot more hands-on training uh, remotely than we can do today. But the technology has been tantalizingly slow to come to market. I'm still working, waiting for Apple to put out its, its VR headset. Hopefully this year, we'll see. Anyway, I've had a couple of episodes about 10 with Ken. You can watch about that as well. One of the things that puzzles me is that for the last year or so, I've been hearing from presidents at colleges who say, wow, our whole business has been saved by the pivot to online delivery. We've got five times as many students. We're never going back. I hear from other presidents at colleges who say, thank goodness that public health restrictions are over. We can return to campus. Our students love this. Our faculty prefer this. Uh, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. So I thought, let me try to pull this together. And I undertook a look at, at almost 50 surveys done in the last 20 years of, of 600,000 higher ed students around the world to try to understand why are these results so wildly different? Why are we why are we hearing from some people that this is good and some people this is bad? Every one of those surveys asks the questions a little differently, finds different results. Uh, this shows you sort of pre, during, and post pandemic. Uh, but, but ultimately, uh, almost all of them were looking at about four different modalities. The purely face-to-face -face one we're all familiar with, where maybe there's some e-texts or a learning management system, but you're really not using online delivery for interaction. A purely online course where you're never face to face on a campus. It's all delivered through various synchronous or asynchronous online platforms. Uh, many student surveys indicated that students wanted the choice to mix and match some purely online courses with some purely face to face courses. Uh, and then quite a few also examined the question of a hybrid delivery method where every course blends the best of both worlds. So you have in-person gatherings for active learning, for interactions, but you have online lectures, you have online uh, discussion boards and so on. So, so those four modalities uh, in general, those 50 surveys took a look at, uh, and ultimately you can see glimpses from some of those surveys that if you're an introvert or an extrovert, you're gonna be at opposite ends of the preference scale. If you're in certain subject areas, if you're of certain ages, you're going to gravitate towards in-person or uh, or online learning as your preferred modality. Uh, and if you have some kinds of disabilities, you may actually gravitate towards uh, online learning instead of face-to-face. -face. So there's a lot of reasons why some students shift one way or another. And a lot of the variation in the surveys is based on who are we surveying? What's the nature of the students involved? Um, 
It also has, of course, been impacted by the experience we all had during the pandemic. Uh, when you look at three years of online learning, we gradually have become more familiar with online and we've been shifting a bit more and more towards openness to online and mixed delivery. Uh, I think in general, the majority of students still lean towards the face-to-face -face or blended delivery model. Um, but, but it's also possible to look at this and say, actually, the biggest group of students are the ones saying they want either to be able to mix and match online and face-to-face -face or to take blended and hybrid delivery. So, so in effect, we need to start trying to figure out how do we do omni-channel delivery of our courses for most students? Uh, as we as we continue to respect their desire to have face to face interactions for extracurriculars, for labs and, and hands on learning. Uh, and as we look at the, the fact that a lot of mature learners, grad students prefer online delivery. So so there's going to be a mixed bag depending on what your institution is like, what your programs are like, who your students are. Uh, what What is the right solution for delivery? As the world becomes increasingly digitized and opens up online access to libraries, lectures, and much more, higher education needs to think carefully about its core value proposition. As the OECD's Director of Education and Skills observed early in the pandemic, colleges and universities must not make the mistake of thinking they are in the business of broadcasting knowledge. I think some observations by the founding editor of Wired magazine, Kevin Kelly, shed some important light. As books, lectures, exams, and even simulated labs move online, the real value academic institutions can offer lies in those things that cannot be digitized. In-person interactions, personalized curriculum, mentorship, and social engagement. Those are really our competitive advantages over MOOCs or industry micro-credentials for the foreseeable future. Join me next time for a deeper look at another pedagogical change that has had widespread impact on the architecture and design of campus classrooms. The shift from lecture to active learning. To see it early and get involved in the conversation, too, I hope you'll join me on my new free online community, Eduvation Circles. Circles is a growing virtual community of more than a thousand forward-looking higher ed leaders and professionals from across Canada and around the world. It's more immediate than an email newsletter, more interactive than a blog, and a great way to engage in year-round discussion, polls, and live streams with me. New episodes of 10 with Ken will appear first here, along with a full archive of past episodes. But if you're not quite ready for the future of online engagement, Sure, you can just subscribe to 10 with Ken on any of a dozen platforms, including YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or even subscribe to my weekly email newsletter at 10withken.com. Thanks again for watching. Yeah!